Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Richard, my friend, welcome to, back to the program. And thank you for spending your night with us tonight. Well, thank you, George. You know, it's an incredibly weird world we're living in right now, as Pat Boone said. I mean, he sounds so amazing. He does. He my sounds gosh. exactly like he sounded 50 years ago. Yeah, he hasn't changed. And he's still singing. And my mother has a crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> my mother had one, too. <laughs> She's 94, that cougar. Amazing. Amazing. Great. So how have you been? Well, I've been incredibly busy. <clears throat> it's almost like while the world is going to <clears throat> hell in a handbasket, we're making some absolutely amazing, astonishing discoveries over here. And it's it's going to be really hard to compress them into, you know, two hours. But I'm going to give it a, as they used to say, the old college try. Well, I got to tell you, Avi Loeb, who you're going to talk about in just a moment, was a guest with our George Knapp a few weeks ago. He's an incredible guy. He's a Harvard astronomer, but man, he is all over the place. Well, Abby seems to have taken up the reins of something that uh, we've been working on for decades, which is proving from the available evidence that NASA has here on Earth evidence that we are not alone. And, you know, the only evidence that science really can trust, of course, is hard, you know, well-proven, tested, independently tested facts. So tonight I'm going to present what I call the Enterprise <clears throat> Abbey Loeb Challenge, because we found something so amazingly weird that there's no other way to describe it than it's, it's a discovery whose time has come. And these discoveries have to do with some lunar material. Tell us how he found out about this. And it's incredible to see someone with a Harvard background because that gives us added credibility. I mean, you've got credibility, but, I mean, to have a Harvard astronomer basically saying some of the things you've been saying for years, that's pretty darn, that's darn good. Well, Abby Loeb seems to be the heir apparent to... Uh, a very ancient Harvard guy who was, you know, at his prime height of the UFO, you know, discussions back in the 1950s and 60s. That was uh, uh, Dr. Donald Menzel. That's and then right. much later, my friend and colleague Carl Sagan, who became kind of a well-known worldwide proponent of the idea that we're not alone, but Carl was never able to put forward any real evidence. Well, we've been working for like 40, 50 years on the real evidence, because I'm not a Harvard astronomer. <laughs> Folks have not been kind of paying much attention, but I think they will now, because I'm, I'm basically proposing that Abby and I join forces and prove once and for all that we're not alone, and in fact, the, the tools are at hand to totally change this really loused up planet for the better. We're not alone, but we're not we have not been allowed to know that we're not. And the idea that the human race has brothers and sisters and other family all out there in the galaxy, and we're somehow quarantined, is has been driving us nuts. The real long-term solution, I think, to what we're seeing in the Middle East and in all kinds of other places is for the the government, our government to start with and others to follow, to reveal the evidence that, in fact, the human race is part of a much, much larger tapestry of people of consciousness, of brilliance, of incredible technology, of the ability with that technology to save the Earth by solving all its short-term problems from, you know, pollution, uh, global warming, to the problems of thermonuclear war itself, and this incredibly persistent problem that, you know, remember that old song, We Always Kill the Ones We Love? Yep, great We're song. We each other out of, out of desperation and, and incredibly bad mental health 
because I think we've been deliberately kept from knowing who we are. And I'm hoping tonight will be, if nothing else, a major step forward in solving that pernicious long-term, and if we don't solve it, ultimately fatal problem. In 2014, a blazing meteor entered our atmosphere, and that opened up the floodgates, didn't it? It certainly did. Um, We've developed a technology, basically the Defense Department, going back to one part of us that perennially has to build all kinds of super weapons and not put resources and money into things that will keep people alive. The U.S. Defense Department has radars all over the planet. And in 2014, it detected an object streaking toward the Earth far in excess of escape velocity, not just from the Earth, but from the sun. In other words, this object unequivocally was coming in faster than the sun could even hold it in orbit. Therefore, it had originated somewhere far beyond the solar system. Anyway, it kept coming toward the Earth, very small object, uh, you know, a few meters across, you know, a few tens of feet, and it smashed into the Earth's atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean at some extraordinary velocity, I think 30, 35,000 miles per hour, and it crashed through the atmosphere and burned up, and the pieces sank off New Guinea. Well, decades later, Avi Loeb, who has this interesting background and incredibly persistent interest in things extraterrestrial and potentially artificial, he garnered with about a million dollars an expedition, went to the Pacific Ocean off New Guinea, lowered what's called a magnetic dredge, meaning a sled on a cable that's highly magnetized. He dragged the bottom of the ocean, and he brought up pieces of this bizarre interloper that had entered the atmosphere, you know, many, many years before. So, Richard, uh, Dr. Loeb uh, picked up these meteorite fragments from the bottom of the sea. What did he do with them? Well, we're talking about fragments that are on the order of little tiny, you know, millimeter-sized droplets. It wasn't like a big rock. or a Okay, rock. little really tiny thing, microscopic type. Microscopic, yeah. So he takes them back to Harvard. He's doing all this, he says, under a million-dollar Harvard grant. I mean, what kind of incredible cutting-edge science can you even begin to do these days for a lousy million bucks, right? <laughs> million dollars ain't what it used to be. Anyway, no, so he true. takes them back to Harvard, and they had the most incredible state-of-the-art analytical labs with electron microscopes and ion microprobes and, you know, um, uh, isotope microassessors and, you know, stuff right out of science fiction. And he cuts the little millimeter-sized droplets of whatever he collected, you know, two miles down under the Pacific. He puts them on the microscope slide uh, after they are sliced into little tiny sections by microscopic diamond saws, which is what, you know, geologists do with rocks and samples these days. In fact, they've been doing it for decades. And when he looks and does the microprobe analysis, which allows him to look at different parts of what's called the thin section, the metallic composition of these little tiny droplets that came in from deep outer space in excess of 30,000 miles per hour, not part of the sun's family at all, turn out to be the most bizarre meteoritic fragments that any scientist anywhere in the world for any time ever, has ever analyzed. Because they're obviously, according to their composition, not from this star. They're not from this sun. They're not from this solar system. And they're not natural. That's the huge thing, George. They cannot be natural because they turned out to be iron, lithium, brillium, titanium, and other exotic metals in a weird exotic mix that simply does not exist anywhere in our solar system or in any of the models projected for any other solar system. They look like they're made of an artificial material or combination of materials that once was part of some kind of ancient alien spaceship.
that blew up instead of a meteorite. Well, it burned up in the atmosphere, but it lasted longer, by the way, even at that incredible velocity, than the tiny little meteors that you see in the night sky that kind of flash across the sky and then are gone. This, Whatever this thing was, it survived almost until the ocean, and then the melted rain of molten droplets fell into the Pacific, fell two miles down, and Loeb was able to pick up a few fragments and, and prove that whatever this thing was, it was not A, from Earth, B, from the solar system, or C, it wasn't even natural. And you know who kind of provided the final linchpin in the analysis? Would that be you? No. Our old friend, Dr. John Brandenburg, Aha. nuclear physicist, was at the Los Alamos National Lab for many years, became part of my independent Mars investigation decades ago at SRI, the Stanford Research Institute. Anyway, I had John on the other side of midnight the other night. He has just published a peer-reviewed paper in an Indian science journal. came out, I think, about a week ago. John's conclusion, not Loeb's now, John Brandenburg's conclusion, based on his unique scientific background, is that not only did Loeb pick up something that is artificial, but it was something that either was, and wait for it, a nuclear weapon. Oh, my God. Now melted hopelessly into little teeny tiny droplets or part of some nuclear ancient spaceship's atomic drive, space drive, propulsion system that had been sent to this solar system from another star because of the unique combination of elements that are never found in nature, including uranium. That's interesting. So definitely not biological. Oh, not biological at all. But what they're calling these days, I, I love how science goes through these phases. Do you know what ET artifacts are called now in the general scientific community as it's becoming more and more credible at Warp 9? What do they call them? They're called techno-signatures. <laughs> Technological signatures. Well, that's, that's a pretty good term. Anyway, Brandenburg has proven not only that Loeb is correct, these are techno-signatures from somebody, but they're techno-signatures with a isotopic ratio demonstrating that they probably could only have come from some kind of very high-tech ancient nuclear device used by someone either to get here or a weapon system that's been coming toward the sun for eons and in the summer of 2014 smashed into the earth, destroyed itself, and left pieces for Abbey Loeb to pick up. Interesting. Now, was there any tie-in between Loeb's discovery and what you discovered a long time ago with the rocks that the astronauts brought back from the moon. Absolutely. That's where, you know, life is weird. You know, there's convergences, there's resonances, there's all kinds of synchronistic patterns. Well, I looked at Loeb's data, and I agree with John that, A, it's artificial, and, B, the only reasonable explanation is it's some kind of ancient nuclear device but it wasn't until I realized that we had almost a 1,000 pounds on Earth of the same kind of extraterrestrial samples. I mean, imagine what the science he was able to do on microscopic fragments just a few millimeters in diameter, smaller than, you know, BVs. Remember BVs? Oh, yeah. Well, he was, the samples he was analyzing were the size of BVs. What if you had 10,000 times as much material to analyze and it hadn't been melted and destroyed but was in some kind of original geometry? Still intact. In, almost intact. What could you do with today's almost magical, godlike science and analytical instrumentation so I began looking on the NASA websites, because they're all over the world, at what are called the thin sections of some of the moon rocks 
the 842 pounds of moon rocks that the agency brought back from the moon. But what does this tell you, Richard? What does this tell you? Well, when I started looking at the moon rocks, and if you look at your photo number four, you'll see a uh, photograph of the uh, uh, one of the moon rocks brought back in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory that was set up in Houston to analyze the rocks 50 years ago. And as you can see from that uh, uh, sample sitting on the scale, uh, what they do is they, they, they thin section them, meaning they take little diamond saws and they slice them into little like wafers that are thinner than, you know, a, a, a poker chip by a factor of probably 100 times. And when you slice any kind of material, including rocks, thin enough, they become transparent. You can shine light through them. So then what they do is they put them on a microscope stand, they illuminate them, and that's where you get microphotograph number five, number five of my items. This is from Apollo 16. The first example that I went to the NASA website and looked at, and lo and behold, in the microscopic thin sections from just one rock, from one lunar mission weighing, you know, a few millionths of an ounce, look at the geometry in that thin section of photograph number five. What do you see in the upper left-hand corner? Well, now you tell me. Well, it's not a, it's not a crystal. It's not a natural melt crystal. It's not a normal natural mineral configuration it's like nothing that I've ever seen in any rock thin sliced anywhere here on Earth. It looks like a fragment of some kind of mechanical circuit or machine or manufactured device, including wires, which have melted partially at the very end against the white background of what we call that inclusion to the bottom left of the geometric orange-looking uh, thing in the upper left-hand corner. Looks like it fell off some robot or something, exactly. doesn't it? Exactly. That's not a rock. No, that's, that's, not not, a that's, not, that's not a rock. That's, that's a fragment of a piece of a machine. So I began thinking, oh, my God, how could I have been so dumb for all the decades, George, that you and I have been talking, that Art and I were talking, that the audience and I have been talking, because... As I looked at these samples, you know, like number two, look at number six, right below it, all right? Blow it up, and you click on them, they get much bigger. What do you see in the middle of sample number six? Strange pink pieces of stuff. And below that, look closely. That's that little brown thing? No, the, the elongated uh, pieces. Bluish. Things. They're all over the place. They're all, and they're machines. You can see the geometry. You can see the little micro dots. You can see artificial, mechanical looking signatures as you look at these moon samples over and over and over. This was just random. We've got 842 pounds of this stuff on Earth, or NASA does, locked up in the vaults under Houston. These are just a few millionths of a pound of material picked totally at random because, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I started doing this, I had no idea what I should look at, what I was looking for, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, then, then look at my, my third example. Look at uh, uh, image number seven, all right? Look in the right-hand section of that image. Don't be distracted by the colors. Look at the shapes and geometries. We have flat things. We have broken things. We have cylinders. We have pipe-like looking things all in a jumble. Remember, this is a three-dimensional uh, set of objects in a two-dimensional slice. So the saw has cut through on both sides a much bigger set of objects to, to get us these fragments. And these are just laying on the surface of the moon? They're just laying on the surface of the moon. Now, let me tell you why this is absolutely crucial. Moon rocks, most moon rocks, unlike rocks on Earth, are not formed from original melts. 
or original lava or original crystallization. The moon, as you know, has been bombarded by meteorites for billions of years. And the repeated bombardment, you know, big craters are smashed into by littler objects that create smaller craters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this has been going on for amount of time that human beings can't even begin to imagine. The sum total of all that smashing and impacting and shock waves and heat and melting and refreezing and melting again and more shock waves is that the lunar soil, which experts call the regolith, can vary in depth from a few inches to tens of feet all over the moon. So what the astronauts were able to pick up, the most common type of rock all over the moon is what scientists call a breccia, which is a technical term meaning a smashed together rock. It's like a fusion of fragments from, you know, hundreds or thousands of other rocks in the history of the moon exposed to meteorites that's been bombarded and smashed and bombarded again and again and again and again. Now, Richard, if you propose to work with Avi Loeb and he turns you down, then what do you do? Well, well, tell us who Avi Loeb is, because if I was the real scientist that I think Avi is, and I'd gone to the lengths to discuss the E.T. interstellar origins of Oumuamua, and I want to come back to Oumuamua later in the morning, and then I was shown this and the fact that it's literally sitting in public domain uh, you know, samples, carefully archived by NASA a half a century ago, and most of it still has not been touched by human tongs or human instrumentation. It's been carefully saved by NASA in their forward-looking thinking from half a century ago to where instrumentation would develop, evolve better techniques than existed in the 60s and 70s that were used to analyze these rocks initially. Abby Loeb is probably the world's recognized leader now as a mainstream, incredibly credentialed Harvard scientist who has conducted the first successful analysis from the underneath the Pacific of extraterrestrial technology. When you combine the what they look like, the little droplets that he brought up, with their ion probe and microphotographic analyses of the elements, lithium, you know, beryllium, iron without nickel, uranium, and John's analysis that this is part of a nuclear technology. Obviously, somebody lost something incredibly sophisticated, or it was sent to us as a message. But that was only a few, you know, micrograms of material. If I'm right, if what I've discovered in these thin sections of the rocks from the astronauts is correct, we've got 800 and 40 plus pounds of extraterrestrial machinery embedded in the moon rocks right here on Earth that are half a century old. And all NASA has to do is invite Abby in through the front door with his team, take rocks at random, analyze them, use all the incredible sophisticated micro technologies that a half a century has now bought us from the time that they were collected by the astronauts on the moon, and we will know from their composition, from their, you know, metallic elements, from their, you know, alloys, from their circuit designs, from the geometry, from the micro wires inside, from the chips, from everything we're seeing in these photographs that I'm showing you tonight, expanded by factors of a million, we will know the history of ancient ET technological civilizations that once lived all over the moon for millions and millions of years. It's right within our grasp. We don't have to spend, if we didn't want to, another dime in going back to the moon, but of course we're going to. Not only is NASA <clears throat> going, the Chinese are going, the Russians are going, 
independent entrepreneurs are going. India is going. India is already gone. Yeah. And they're going to go back. And Elon Musk, a private enterprise, love that term, private enterprise mission beginning in a couple, three years. And he's part of the Artemis lunar program to take NASA astronauts, you know, NASA citizens, international astronauts, down to the surface of the moon to collect more samples at the lunar poles and bring them. We're at the edge of the revolution, George, and Abby Loeb can go down in history as the guy who kicked off that revolution, and all he has to do is use the same techniques on the moon rocks that he used on his samples from the South Pacific, and we're in a totally, totally different and incredibly enriching you know, historical era where we stop killing each other and we look upward and wonder with real science behind us who the hell is out there. We could only pray. We can only pray. Now, Apollo 12. Well, we can do more than pray. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you and your audience tonight is I need the help of your audience. You have an audience measured in millions, right? Yes, I do. All they have to do is all send Abby Loeb a text or an email and say, be there or be square. Propose the Abby Loeb challenge. Prove Hoagland wrong. Remember, all of science is not about finding things, but proving the other guy's theory about the things are wrong. Why not prove you right? Well, it, inevitably, if I'm right, the science, the independent science that Loeb could do on, remember, 840 two pounds of rock and you don't even have to destroy them with this technology today to see what's inside it's called three-dimensional x-ray tomography remember when they slide patients into that big metal tube in the hospital i hate that tube well it, for claustrophobic people yeah but it non-destructively looks through you and with ai computer technology it now creates three-dimensional scans down to the level of microns, if desired, of the inside of human beings or any other, you know, materials exposed to that technology without destroying them. So NASA could subject its 800-plus pounds of samples to this kind of non-destructive three-dimensional imaging. It could find those rocks that have the biggest, you know, fragments of ancient ET machines and technology still within them, it could then analyze those with current state-of-the-art techniques. And we're light years down the road to, A, proving the Apollo missions really did go to the moon, B, proving that they found and brought back to Earth incredible treasure troves of ET technology, which we can back engineer and see we might even find in this melange micro dots or fragments of ancient lunar libraries that we can decode again right here on Earth. This is this is so big, George, that two hours is not big enough and long enough to describe everything that this is going to mean. If you're correct, I don't think it was left behind on purpose, or they would have left better samples, don't you think? No, 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 no. If the moon has been inhabited like the solar system for millions of years, which is our model, when you smash and smash and smash, you get fragments and fragments and fragments. From the samples that I've analyzed so far, we're looking at fragments of ordinary human-scale machines that have been smashed and then incorporated in these melted and smashed together rocks, but we're also looking at little teeny tiny fragments of what we call nanotechnology, which is little tiny fully formed machines on a scale of millionths of an inch. George, what does that mean? Well, that's pretty dramatic. Well, what does it mean? It means human it means, conscious uh, technology conscious ETs, conscious aliens, conscious predecessors of the human race existed in a range of sizes all the way from our size, our scale, down to the microscopic 
on this is this is not a small revolution. This is the whole game. This is game match set. This is everything that everybody listening to this show tonight has ever wished for about NASA's missions, about the discussions of UFOs, of ETs, of aliens. It's all right there under Houston waiting for us to analyze it in the teams independently led to start with by Dr. Avi Loeb. And maybe it's not E.T., maybe it's us from the past with high technology. you got it. You've absolutely got it because we never looked. What if you could find here and there the same kind of examples in smash brushes found here on Earth? Because they are found. But no one has ever imagined that they could find technology because when geologists look at rocks, you know, what do they see? They see rocks, right? Remember that old cliche, to a carpenter, everything looks like a nail? And a rock is a rock. Except in this case, in three cases that I put up there, again, just at random, there's little imprisoned fragments of high technology, micro-machines, fragments of circuits, whatever, and they're all accessible to humanity if Abby Loeb will pick up the challenge and this audience, all they have to do is send Abby Loeb text and email saying, for damn sake, go look. Do, does he, does he know you yet? Say again? Does he know you yet? Oh, we've been in touch years ago. He claimed that he couldn't come on my show because it was too late. And I've had everybody trying to get him to call me once, once we've uh, you know discovered this. And so far, the phone has not rung. But I guarantee you, Avi Loeb is a brilliant politician as well as a scientist. Look at what he's done. If he doesn't pick up this challenge, we'll know two things. Either he is totally uncurious, which I wouldn't buy for a nanosecond, or something is inhibiting him, something is directing him from above or from below the deep state to go nowhere near this, which means if he doesn't pick up the challenge, we will assemble other scientists to do it because these rocks belong to all American taxpayers. They're our rocks. We own them. We can take NASA to court and force them to analyze these micro nanotechnological machines. All right. Now tell me about this lunar stone circle you found. Well, you know that old joke about ketchup? No, not really. Life is like a ketchup bottle. Oh, okay. I've First heard that. First bottle come, and then a lot. Of. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a lot of incredible revolutionary stuff going on, because literally a week ago, at, in the wake of a successful Indian mission, which you mentioned a few minutes ago, the mm-hmm. Chandrayaan-3 mission, suddenly people all over the world began looking at the successful prior Indian mission, which was called Chandrayaan-2 which left a lunar orbiter still orbiting the moon with fuel and instrumentation, radios, and cameras. And people began looking at the orbital imagery of the moon from the Chandrayaan-2 spacecraft, which is still in orbit even though the Chandrayaan-2 lander, you know, crashed uh, four years ago. And some of those people, in particular a guy named uh, Marty McGuire, He's a citizen scientist. Uh, he's, he called himself the Backyard Astronomer from Pennsylvania. He's got a website, which we're going to post on the other side of midnight for our Saturday show. I want to tell everybody, if you think this is exciting, wait till you get three hours of more photographs, more analysis, more discussion by the Enterprise Mission team as to what all this means, and more outlines of what Abby Loeb can do to basically rescue humanity. I mean, this is what's in Abby's hands. He can do the science that will rescue humanity from going nuts by thinking deludedly that we're all alone. But can't you get this done without him if you had to? Of course, I could put together my own team. But I want Abby to be part of the party because he was brave enough and bright enough to stick his neck out of Maumuamua, and he was the second scientist on Earth to claim that a Maumuamua the interstellar object that zipped through the solar system back in 2018. Was artificial. Was artificial. I was the first, and I know things about a Muamua that Abby Loeb has not imagined yet, 
which are testable, again, in his laboratories at Harvard, and all he has to do is talk to me, and we will both go down historically as people who cared enough to uncover for humanity the very best. Marty McGuire opened up a Reddit thread where he posted orbital imagery of the Apollo sites taken not by an American spacecraft, but by an Indian spacecraft. And I've got an example in item number eight. On the left-hand side is an Apollo 12 Allen Bean black and white picture of the uh, Apollo 12 landing site with the lunar module there on the rim of the crater. You can see it, right? Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side is a close-up from the Chandrayaan-2 lunar orbiter of the same site. There's the bottom of the limb with the long shadow in the left. Look at what's going on in the bottom right of that image. What do you see? Bottom right. Bottom right of the two-frame composite. Image number eight. Yep. Over on the right-hand corner. Well, skip to the next picture. This is an enlargement with the red arrow. What do you see? There's some kind of object down there. It's an incredible circle of moon rock. With a big one in the center, look at the shadows. That's how you know that it's the biggest, the tallest. And the alignment of the rocks is pointing toward that much bigger object in the upper right with the, with the red arrow. Now look at image number 10, okay? This is now a close-up showing the alignments between multiple. Uh, These are the ones with the green arrows the green and the white arrows. Yeah, they're all pointing at that object in the upper right. And if you look at the inset in the left-hand corner of the same frame, image number 10, what do you see there? A huge crater. No, 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 no. The inset with the white arrow coming out of it. It's a box. I don't, it's a I don't see it. It's geometric planar box. You're still talking about that white-looking thing? Yeah. Yes, look at it. It's got flat sides. It's got straight edges. It's got shaped geometry. It's a box. That's a photograph, an enlargement of a, of a beam photograph, an astronaut photograph taken from the surface from up in number eight. You mean like it was left behind, that exactly. kind of a box? It's an archive. It's a library. It's a time capsule either left for human beings by aliens, E.T.'s, George, which from the moon rocks we already know exist, remember? Mm -hmm. Or, your words a few moments ago, it was left to us as an archive, a time capsule, from our own ancient ancestors, from a previous high-tech civilization here on Earth, which went to the moon, found all this evidence, and left a cairn, a marker, a library, to contain the information for their dim, dimmed ancient descendants that would someday come back to the moon like we now have. Brian in Indianapolis is with us. Hey, Brian, welcome. Hey, George, how are you this morning? Uh, all is well. Awesome, man. Hey, Richard, good to talk to you, man. What them, them pictures are just outstanding. I'm, well, they're real. They're man. NASA's. We I haven't was... touched them. We couldn't touch them. They're electronic. Hey, I got two quick questions. I know time is short. Question number one, you, you were on Art Bell way back in the 90s. With a, You had a conference maybe out in California. You had a guy from NASA, Ron Johnston, and a geologist with the last name of Hicks on there. Nick. They, Ron they, Nick. The, yeah. The, N-I-C-K-S. The uh, station ran an a article or a uh, piece on you at night that stayed, they were kind of making fun of you, but they asked Alan Bean about – what he thought about what you guys were presenting, and he said that you guys needed to get new glasses. So my question is, did you, have you ever gotten a chance to get to ask Alan Bean about him saying that with all these pictures and stuff that you have him in the photographs of all these structures and these spheres on the moon? And question number two, real quick. I got a, these binocular telescopes that are just awesome. I was looking at the supermoon. Can you explain what the colors around the edges of the moon are? I know it's kind of off topic a little bit, but what are the 
colors that are around the edges of the moon. How, what causes that? And I'll take Manches off the air. Okay. Uh, those right, are let light me, prisms. Let me answer his first question first, because ironically, Bean is the guy who took the surface pictures of this lunar stone end. Um, Alan Bean, we held a press conference at the National Press Club back in uh, the 1990s, showing you know, much more primitive versions of our research at that point. And the interesting thing is that right after our press conference, Alan Bean started doing color paintings of the moon. There's one I've laid out in item number three tonight of my images. The upper left-hand panel is a color painting that Bean did of the Surveyor Crater Landing Site, you know, from his walk on the moon with Pete Conrad back in 1969 in November. And in the upper right-hand corner, he's painted this lunar Stonehenge from one of the photographs with all of the amazing geometry as seen from the surface. I was never able to talk to Bean. I only heard distantly, you know, from people that knew him. But I'm telling you that I think Bean was under prescription by the military <clears throat> not to tell the truth about what's there. So he decided to do it in a very, what I call, Emily Dickinson fashion. You know, tell all the truth, but tell it slant through his paintings. Because when you compare his paintings to what the moon looks like on the Apollo photographs, like right there in item number three, also items one and two, Look at those, those. Those are all real colors. All we've done is increase the saturation of the official Apollo imagery from the astronauts from the moon. I think all of this has been under incredible deep security prohibition. Now is the time when the truth is coming out. And unfortunately, Alan Bean died a while ago, so we can't share in the joy of showing this to humankind. But he certainly is here in spirit. He was a great naval officer as well, he, and he did. He passed away five years ago. Mark in Ohio, go ahead, Mark. You're on with Richard Hoagland. Oh, what a pleasure, what a pleasure. I have to do a shout-out right away to Corny, okay, because this is Mike Papa Hansen, and he'll know what I mean. 95 Bravo, that was my uh, MOS, uh, MP, military police, and for McClellan, Alabama. But anyway, and a pleasure to talk to you guys, and a uh, big fan of Richard C., okay, from the Art Bell days. And uh, my, I have a simple question, and uh, we always struggle with the Big Bang Theory, okay? That's one thing. And my father, you know, who was a Carl Sagan fan, and it's like everybody wanted to know, Richard? What is nothing? If you could make it to the <laughs> end of the universe, what is nothing? If you could pop that bubble, I know it's, and Tommy's smart, and you know, all, all you guys are smart. It's a forever expanding. What is nothing, Richard? And I'll shut up. Well, we live in a hyperdimensional universe of multiple universes. So our reality, our 3D reality, is only a part of a much bigger reality. Did you hear the other day that the new data from Webb? is pushing back the date of the Big Bang creation of our 3D universe twice as far. The canonical age, the current age that everybody says the universe is, is 13.7 billion years old, right? Exactly. Well, scientists now, based on the latest Hubble data, which is basically galaxies that are much more mature and look like our Milky Way much further back in time than they should, they're claiming now that the newest web data is actually making the universe twice as old. Oh, my gosh. 28.7 billion years old compared to 13.6 or 7. So we're, in the, we're surrounded by revolutions. The only thing that's keeping us on the ground is this damn deep state security prohibition. They don't want us to know anything. And that's why this Abbey Loeb challenge is so critical, because if this audience sends enough emails, Abbey will respond We'll do this together, and we blow the doors off of a 70-plus-year cover-up. Or even one good email, Richard, will do it. Yep. Let's go to Catherine in British Columbia, Canada. Hi, Kath. Hi, George. Hi, Richard. Hi, Catherine. I, I, I have this 
burning desire to know this. Uh, the, the moon rocks, you know, how you, if you have anything you stick on the counter, it will get room temperature or whatever. It takes on the temperature of the room. Yep. Now, these rocks, did they come with any sort of temperature? Were they hot, cold? Will they re keep a temperature of any kind? Thank you. Interesting question. What a really interesting question. Well, they will take up the temperature of what their surroundings are. So currently, most of the 142 pounds of moon rocks are kept at liquid nitrogen temperatures in nitrogen in vaults under Houston so that nothing changes. Because changes, environmental changes, go up not linearly but as, uh, logarithmically with temperature. So if you keep something at liquid nitrogen temperatures, it basically will stay that way forever. But when they bring the samples into the lab and they, they cut you know, thin sections, they obviously warm up to the temperatures of the laboratory, which here on Earth is in the you know, low 70s, upper 60s, right? That's not enough to change the composition of the rocks in any way. The key is you don't want them exposed to Earth's air, to any micro microbial contamination, whatever, and they take multiple steps to keep that from happening. So this, these rocks are as good as the day the astronauts brought them back. Let's get Chris in Canton, Ohio. Hey, Christopher, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm an amateur, amateur astronomer. I belong to a group of astronomers. Great. And uh, I want to ask you, tell me what you can, what I've noticed about helium-3. Two years ago, I was in the Rocky Mountains with Arlo Guthrie with his, his telescope. He says, hey, Chris, come here, look at this. What is that? I said, that dust coming up from the moon, somebody's up there doing some mining. So do we have the mineral rights of uh, helium-3? And it looks like to me all these countries are going to be going to the moon mining it. Can you enlighten me on this subject? Well, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty forbid nation states from owning anything on the moon, real estate, samples, rocks, ET artifacts, whatever. However, the treaty does not prohibit private enterprise corporations from going to the moon, staking a claim, bringing back samples, and mining whatever they can find. So that's the loophole that interest in the moon is going to drive towards scavenging helium-3 from the regolith, bringing it back, <clears throat> and someday using it in nuclear reactors here on Earth that are safe and environmentally clean because they produce no radioactive byproducts. Is the moon loaded with helium-3, Richard? Well, the surface regolith, because it's been exposed to what's called the solar wind, and the helium-3 is coming from the sun, from the solar wind and its trap. Now, of course, my extrapolation of the science is that <clears throat> by the time we get there to do the mining, it'll be obsolete, because the real incredible high-tech super technologies that we need that are hyperdimensional, that are not nuclear, that are torsion field technologies, those secrets are in these machines in the rocks, which is why, if Loeb accepts the challenge, everything can change on the Earth for the better because that technology can be operated here on Earth just as well as on the moon. Gerard in California, let's get your question in real quick, Gerard. Go ahead. Thank you, George. Uh, Professor Hoagland, just some housekeeping here. Uh, Saturday is a solar eclipse visible around noon in yeah, Chicago. Did, did, did I say mistake? Uh, it, it, lunar oh, okay, eclipse? fine. Okay, number two, the visible universe boundary is about 14.3 billion parsecs, which is about 46 billion light years. So, yeah, the old, uh, you know, 20 billion light year radius is doubled. Um, but I had a question, uh, actually a comment on the guy who saw colors on the moon. I'm an optician, and that's from his refractor lenses. If you look at a bright object with these no, binoculars. No, it's not. Look at the photographs. Look at items one and two. And what, number one, the top panel is the NASA published image. Item number two below it, you know, or, or 1A, is simply a saturated version from the same digital file the colors were recorded objectively by the cameras, by the film NASA took to the moon, a special film that was developed by my friend Charlie Wyckoff at EG&G. &G. No, the colors are real. The question you should be asking, since it's not an optical illusion in uh, Alan Bean's brain, 
is what would cause the colors that can be photographed. That's the crucial question. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.